Just two short years later, ex-New York City mayor and billionaire Michael Bloomberg is here using his billions to try and take away our firearm rights. Since buying his way onto our ballot, he has used his billions to hire nearly every political consultant, law firm, and political strategist. His hired guns tell us this is an initiative to keep bad guys from getting guns. In reality, it's an initiative to stop good guys from using guns. Citizen initiatives are no way to, to write laws, particularly when written by nanny state elitists from a region of a state where forests are made of pavement and concrete and whose opinions of gun ownership is shaped by drug dealers, terrorists, and inner city crime. If passed, question three, will micromanage every situation in which a firearm is used and empower our state government to place a heavy boot on the throat of every law-abiding gun owner while putting government and in law enforcement in a difficult situation and in the position of enforcing a bad law. Ladies and gentlemen, if history teaches us anything, it is that when push comes to shove and it's time to take action and not just talk, good people fight. And when good people fight, good people win. Today's speaker has helped the American people prove that time and time again in past elections you can win. Thanks in part, light to part excuse me, thanks in large part to his vision and leadership, American voters have risen up in force and defeated anti-gun, anti-freedom politicians and policy across the country. He's lobbied for the NRA for more than 20 years and for nearly a decade and a half, he served as principal political strategist for the NRA Institute for Legislative Action. The legislative and electoral arm of what many consider the most powerful force in American politics today. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce the speaker for today. Many of you know him, and I suspect many of you love him. Please welcome the executive director of the NRA Institute for Legislative Action, Mr. Chris W. Cox. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the music too. How about that? Uh, thanks for the kind introduction. It's great to be here. I want to join you in congratulating Suzanne and Rupert. Again, congratulations for all the great work you've done in the recognition today. Uh, friends, 200 years ago, 240 years ago this summer, in the Declaration of Independence, the framers of America's Constitution said we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So what exactly does liberty mean? The simple definition is that liberty is the state or condition of people who are able to speak and act freely. Liberty is the power to do or choose or decide for yourself. But more and more in America today, the power to do or choose or decide for yourself is being taken away by elites who want to deny you the ability to define your own destiny. These people say they're smarter than you, more educated than you. They say their motives are more enlightened than yours, and they think their self-assigned moral superiority gives them the right to dictate to you how to live your life. And former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg is a perfect example of that. He believes he should decide everything from how big a soda you can buy to how much salt you're allowed to put in your food to what colors are acceptable for the new roof you want to put on your home. Now Bloomberg, as you've heard, is pouring millions of dollars trying to make the state of Maine just like New York City when it comes to gun control. He's starting by starting, again, not finishing, just starting by pushing a ballot initiative, question three this November. Whether or not you own a gun, you need to know question three would be a nightmare for all of you because it's an unenforceable, unenforceable, unfunded mandate. And it won't stop a single violent criminal from getting a gun. But what it will do is turn law-abiding citizens into accidental criminals overnight. And it will cut a big chunk out of your freedom. 
Friends, if you have to consult a lawyer before loaning your rifle to your cousin for deer season, you aren't that free. If you make a new friend at the range and you want to ask to shoot his gun, but you don't because you're afraid you might be committing some crime, you aren't that free. If you have to drive, as Governor LePage said, if you have to drive to the gun store, stand in line, give up your personal information, and pay a transfer fee just to loan your hunting rifle to a neighbor for the weekend, and then do it all again on Monday when he gives it back, is anyone safer for all your time and money? Of course not. So why do Bloomberg and Obama and Hillary Clinton really want their so-called universal background checks? Well, Obama's own Justice Department said that for universal background checks to work, you would need gun registration. Gun registration. Their Justice Department said that's the only way you get it to work. Friends, cities and states have used the scheme of gun registration for decades, and so have other countries. If history teaches us anything, it's that it's useless for fighting crime because criminals won't register their guns. The only thing registration has done time and time again is give the government a list to tax them or to take them. Folks, we here in this room know, just as Thomas Jefferson warned, that the natural progress of things is for liberty to yield and government to gain ground. We also know that power corrupts and that absolute power corrupts absolutely. And in the scope of human history, Hitler, Stalin, Mao, Pol Pot are less than a blink of the eye in our past. Those human tragedies might as well have happened yesterday. But too many people today say, well, you know, the world's different now. The millennial generation seems to believe that government is unerringly a force for good and that giving up your freedoms for the promise of a little safety, you know, it's the progressive thing to do. But we know where the loss of liberty leads. The world's been down that road too many times before. That road might have been paved with the best of intentions, but it leads to a place of terror. Please watch. I was born in Greece in 1939. Nazi war planes bombed us unmercifully. Executions in the streets were common. I saw a horror you could never imagine. Human beings became animals, starving and desperate. But me, I was lucky. Soon after the war, I saw the Statue of Liberty, and I cried. I've been blessed by the freedom and opportunity only America can offer. Today, I feel a duty to speak out. There will always be evil in this world, but the one thing that separates America from every other country is our freedom. And the one freedom that protects all the others is our Second Amendment. Never give it up, never. I am the National Rifle Association of America and I am freedom's safest place. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's been said for, you know, that those who forget the hard lessons of history or history are doomed to repeat it. But young voters today can't count on the media and certainly not the national media, to tell the truth. And that's why we're taking these messages and these stories to the airways across this country, because Americans need to know the truth at what's really, about what's really at stake. And the fact is, the debate over gun control in this country, it's not about universal background checks. It's not about this gun or that ammunition. It's about power. It's about control. And it's about a growing trend in this country where disconnected, uncaring elites political elites, media elites, the rich, the powerful, and the connected want to dictate to you how to live your life. They say they know what's best for you, so you better just sit down, shut up, and do as they say. And it's not just the Second Amendment they're after. 
All of our freedoms are under their acts. Just look at Obamacare. When a federal law says you must buy some federally approved insurance or pay heavy fines to the IRS, are you really free to do as you please? You know, I might be the chief of lobbyists for the National Rifle Association, and the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms might be the beginning and end of NRA's mission, but our freedoms are all connected. They depend on each other. And when one freedom is denied or restricted by the powers that be, all our freedoms are diminished. When the Attorney General of the United States talks about using RICO, organized crime prosecutions, to silence skeptics of global warming, so Obama can wage war on coal or oil, that damages your First Amendment right to free speech. When Obama says he wants to use secret government watch lists to, de to deny your Second Amendment right to own a gun, even if you've never been accused, let alone convicted of a crime, that destroys your Fifth Amendment right to due process. Your Fourth Amendment right to privacy is followed on the internet, photographed at traffic lights, data, man data mined by marketers, and data based by Obamacare. At college campuses across this country, our nation's future leaders are being taught that the First Amendment right to free speech is dangerous, that the language is full of terrifying trigger words, and that expressing a view that departs from the liberal orthodoxy is not only a good way to fail in school, it's also a good way to get kicked out of school. If you think I'm kidding, look at Maryland, where they kicked a second grader out of school for chewing his Pop-Tart into an the shape of an imaginary gun. True story. Whether it's your First Amendment right to free speech or your Fourth Amendment right to privacy or your Fifth Amendment right to due process or your Sixth Amendment right to be confronted with the witnesses who say you can't be trusted to own a gun, our Bill of Rights today is being attacked on every front. But you know, it's one thing to have due process restricted or your free speech curtailed but it's an entirely different thing when your Second Amendment right to have a gun to protect yourself in your own home is denied, and you're forced to go to sleep at night in fear. Put yourselves in the shoes of someone who lived with that loss of liberty. Just imagine, you work hard, but you can't afford to live in a fancy neighborhood like Michael Bloomberg. No, you live in the projects, and it's overrun with drug dealers and gang members. You don't feel safe in your own home, the police aren't there when you need them, and in fact, they don't really like to come around. You heard the Supreme Court said that you can keep a gun in your home to defend yourself, but it seems like that only applies to other people, rich people, because the housing authority says they'll throw you out on the street if you do it. Please watch. I'm a good person. I never bother anybody, but I can't afford a nice house in a safe neighborhood. I live in a government high-rise. Gangbangers and drug dealers walk down our halls every day. My neighbors and I were scared. We called the police, but they can't keep us safe. Some of us are too afraid to even leave our apartments. But the housing authority told me, if I bought a gun to protect myself, they'd throw me to the streets. If I'm not free because of my address today, what makes you think you'll be free tomorrow? I marched behind Martin Luther King at Selma. I know my rights. Now I have my gun. I am the National Rifle Association of America, and I'm freedom's safest place. The truth of the matter is, Josephine Byrd, that wonderful lady in that video, she didn't know where to turn, so she turned to the NRA. And we helped her sue the Public Housing Authority to reclaim her right to feel safe in her own home. That case was Jane Doe versus the Delaware Public Housing Authority, and it went all the way to the Delaware Supreme Court. The reason she filed under Jane Doe was she was so scared to have her name on it because she thought they were going to kick her to the streets. Well, you know what? Delaware Supreme Court agreed with Josephine Byrd and us and found in her favor by a unanimous decision. The right to feel safe in your own home, the right to survive, isn't something that depends on your tax bracket or zip code. It's your right. The government didn't give you that right. It was yours at birth. Politicians have no authority 
trying to take it away. And we'll fight them every step of the way when they try. And that's why this year's elections are so crucial when it comes to your freedom. Some of you know that eight years ago, the United States Supreme Court ruled in a five to four split decision that the Second Amendment protects the real right to own a gun in your home for protection. It was the first time the court had ruled that the right to keep and bear arms was your individual right. And in doing so, it put an end to Washington, D.C.'s total ban on handguns in the home for self-defense. Two years later, in the case McDonald versus Chicago, the Supreme Court ruled that this right was fundamental and that no city or state could take it away. You want to know what Hillary Clinton said about those two decisions? Please listen. Here again, the Supreme Court is wrong on the Second Amendment, and I am going to make that case every chance I get, so I will need your help on that. Folks, since Hillary Clinton's comments came to light, her campaign's gone through all sorts of contortions to claim that Hillary didn't mean what she said or didn't say what she meant. But here's the truth. You can't say the Supreme Court was wrong on the Second Amendment without also saying the Supreme Court was wrong to rule it's an individual right, because that was the core of the McDonald and Heller decisions. Today, with the death of Justice Scalia, the Supreme Court split right down the middle, four votes to four, on whether you have the basic individual right to keep a gun in your home for self-defense. And if Hillary Clinton wins the White House in November, you can bet she'll stack the court with justices who share her belief. I think Charlton Heston said it best when he said that the Second Amendment is an order of importance, the First Amendment. It's the one right that protects all the others. It's the one freedom that makes freedom, in any of its forms, defensible. To quote St. George Tucker, one of the fathers of American constitutional law, the right of self-defense is the first law of nature. Wherever the right of the people to keep and bear arms is under any color or pretext whatsoever prohibited, liberty, if not already annihilated, is on the brink of destruction. Why is that true? Because the right to protect yourself is the most fundamental right we have as living beings. That's why self-defense is considered a, a natural right. And it's why we will never apologize for defending that freedom. Americans know they can count on the NRA to stand on principle. They know they can count on the NRA to tell the truth. They know the NRA won't hesitate to take on anybody, be it President Obama, Michael Bloomberg, Hillary Clinton, or anyone else, to protect that birthright. So if you want to know what, what it looks like to see the freedom slip away, talk to Josephine Byrd about what it was like to be disarmed and defenseless. For that matter, talk to Harvey Limbo, right here in Portland, whose home was broken into five times before he got a gun to protect himself, only to have the housing authority tell him, get rid of the gun or get out. Thanks to many of the legislators in this room and your great Governor LePage, a bill was passed and signed into law to prevent that from ever happening again. But folks, that's the ultimatum we face in this year's elections. Don't wake up the morning after election day and realize that Michael Bloomberg just bought a piece of your freedom with question three. Don't wake up and face the reality of Hillary Clinton for the next four to eight years. Don't wake up and realize too late that the next two to four Supreme Court justices will be appointed by someone who says you have no individual right to keep a gun for self-defense. Stand and fight to defend that freedom. Spread the word to everyone you know. Corner them at work, at church, in the grocery store, or wherever you find them. Call them, email them, fax them if you still have a fax. Contact them however you can and let them know the truth, that this is a fight for their freedom. In this election, we don't have the luxury of voting on other issues. We no longer have a choice anymore. So stand and fight for your freedom. Stand and fight for your safety. Stand and fight for the one essential liberty that protects us from the tyranny of surrender. If you do, we will save the, la la the last great bastion of freedom on the planet, the United States of America. Thank you very much.